to join the Covenant Wealth Strategies Stone Barn Speaker Series event. Today, we will be discussing Social Security and preparing for retirement. Uh, we're delighted to have Jennifer Dayhill, who is a director at MFS, a mutual fund family. She's been there for 35 years, and she supports uh, Delaware and Maryland advisors, such as uh, Covenant Wealth Strategies. She supports and educates financial advisors on investment trends and products, and in her spare time enjoys racing sailboats on the Chesapeake Bay uh, near Annapolis. Jen's got two sons, and one's graduating from college in less than two weeks, so she is very excited about the empty nest scenario, which is imminent. So we're pleased to have Jen with us today. And we also have Tony Kaslowski, who is Jen's internal support and you'll forgive me, I don't have all the uh, bio on Tony, but we're delighted to have Tony with us today as well. Our speaker today is Karen Ireland, and uh, I have to say I spoke with Carolyn, Karen earlier this week and was just completely impressed. So Karen, Karen I'm, I'm trying not to set the bar here too high, if you will, but um, Karen is a CFP. She's been in the industry for 20 years and um, is, uh, works with MFS, uh, basically uh, providing support for financial advisors. She is exceptionally knowledgeable in areas of retirement planning and specifically Social Security. And in fact, she has written all of the material that we're going to be viewing today. Um, so uh, this is a uh, original presentation developed by Karen herself. Uh, during the winter time, she and her husband Matt enjoy skiing, and on their list of things to do is to ski at all the different Winter Olympic sites. So far, she's completed five of those. Um, she also enjoys skydiving, luge, bobsledding, and repelling off of waterfalls, but not so much bungee jumping. So. Um, uh, she and her dad and brother are organic farmers in Minnesota, which is why Karen and Matt lo live in a farming town an hour north of Boston in southern New Hampshire. So there's the lowdown on Karen. And uh, again, I just really enjoyed our conversation earlier this week. It was meant to be a technology checkout to make sure all the technology worked and everybody was on the same page and comfortable, but uh, we bantered back and forth. Uh, for uh, quite a few moments uh, discussing different strategies and techniques and uh, just really, really enjoyed our conversation, Karen. So without further ado, uh, Karen, I'll ask you to go ahead and jump right into the presentation. We will, of course, be taking questions. So throughout Karen's presentation, please email any questions that you have to michelle at covenantwealthstrategies.com and Michelle will assimilate those questions, and then we'll uh, do a little bit of Q&A uh, at the end of Karen's presentation. So Karen, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you all for being here. And Michelle, my screen changed a little bit once we went into record mo mode. Can you see questions, at, or for questions, email Michelle. Great, thank you for confirming. So before we get into the formal agenda of Social Security, I'm sure the biggest question all of you have is, will Social Security actually be there throughout my lifetime? As long as you're 55 and older, I wouldn't worry about it. And I say that for a few reasons. Number one, if you look at the Social Security reports, or if you look at all of the options before Congress re reformed Social Security, and if you have trouble sleeping, pull them up, and I guarantee you, you will not have troubles falling back asleep. But if you look at all of those reports, all of them are protecting benefits for anyone who is 55 or older. When they talk about cutting benefits, they're talking about cutting benefits for people who are younger than 55 and not yet eligible for Social Security. And then finally, the realistic scenario, we all know the biggest voting population, it's the 55 and older population. And if your benefits are cut, I'm pretty sure you'll let your local representative, re representative know exactly how you feel about it. So with that, what we're going to do, we'll talk about how your own benefits are calculated, we'll explore options if anyone's ever been married, and then finally end with everyone's favorite topic, which is taxes. So with that, 
When it comes to Social Security, the most important thing to understand is this concept of the full retirement age. It's somewhere between ages 66 and 67. Take a look, figure out your full retirement age, and what you'll notice is that all Social Security calculations are based on this full retirement age. And the answer to any question you may have, which is, hey, I'm younger than full retirement age and want to do X, Y, Z, answer is simply no. And that's because if you do anything before that full retirement age, your benefits are reduced or there's penalties. For example, your Social Security retirement benefits. So if I talk about retirement benefits, I'm not talking about your retirement assets, your 401ks. I'm talking about that benefit that Social Security gives you when you uh, start collecting based on your earnings history. You'll notice that retiring and claiming Social Security are two separate decisions. Now you could take Social Security at 62, but it's reduced. After your full retirement age, you notice that grows by 8% per year until age 70. This happens automatically. Technically, it's a monthly increase. So another way of thinking about this is every three months, you get a 2% raise in your Social Security benefits. And the 8% growth, it's after tax and it's inflation adjusted. So with interest rates being so low, I believe the yield on a 10-year treasury right now is around 1.6%. So with interest rates being so low, that 8% after tax inflation adjusted growth becomes even more powerful, especially if you or your spouse expects to have a longer retirement. Next, working and receiving social security. Let's let's start off with the good news. The moment you turn that full retirement age, you can work and you can earn as much as you want and collect Social Security. It's only if you're under full retirement age that there's limits on how much you can earn if you also want to receive Social Security. Now, they only care about your wages after you start Social Security. So you can earn as much as you want before you claim Social Security. They only care after you claim. And they only care about your wages. So you can have as much money coming in from your pensions, your IRAs, your stock options, etc. However, this test, it's going to affect all Social Security benefits, whether it's your own or a benefit off your spouse. So that means first thing to consider before you apply for Social Security, first thing is, are you working? And if you're working and under that full retirement age, keep it simple, don't take Social Security. Then the follow-up question becomes, well, what happens when I retire? Do I take Social Security? Do I not take Social Security? In that case, sit down with Ward or another member of the team to discuss how much you can withdraw from your portfolio. If that's enough, maybe take Social Security at 70. If it's not enough, maybe take Social Security sooner. It's more important, in my opinion, that we maximize all of your sources of income and not just Social Security. As part of that discussion with Ward and the team, also talk with them about your asset allocation. So for example, let's say you're withdrawing 4% and you're invested 100% in bonds and CDs. Look at that. Even though you feel secure because you're not seeing the market's ups and downs, there's only a 44% chance that your money's going to last throughout retirement. But you add, in this case, just 25% equities. Look at what happens. This is why it's so important to stay invested in the markets no matter what happens, even if it's only 25 or 50%, because that's the best way of ensuring that your money beats inflation and lasts throughout retirement. So now that we know how your benefits are calculated, let's explore options if, if you've ever been married. So let's start off with the spousal benefits. We'll use my parents. Dad has a higher benefit, mom has a lower benefit. Mom can receive up to 50% of dad's benefit as long as she's at full retirement age. 
they're available at 62, but if she claims at 62, it's reduced. If mom receives this benefit off dad, it's not going to reduce dad's benefit. But since mom worked, mom receives a higher of her benefit or that benefit off dad. Mom doesn't get both, she gets a higher of the two. Some of you may be hoping that you can start with that spousal and then switch over. That option is only available to anyone born before 1954. In other words, turning 68 this year. So for most of you, when you apply, Social Security simply gives you one benefit and you're stuck with that. Now, in order to receive that spousal benefit, you have to be currently married for one year. Divorcees have to be married for 10 years. If you're currently married, it's only one year. So that's great news if you get married later on in life. And also, in order for mom to receive this benefit, dad has to be receiving his benefits. So if dad's not receiving his Social Security benefit, mom can't receive a spousal benefit off dad. So the question may be the same that my mom had, which is, hey, I'm planning on retiring at 62. What do I get now? And then what happens when your dad applies? So here we have Alex, Blake, and Chris. And yes, it's A, B, C to hopefully make it easier to remember. They're all 62 and they all want to know what do I get now? And then what do I get when my spouse applies? So they're all retiring this year. So Alex applies at 62. Instead of receiving $1,000, which would have been Alex's benefit at their full retirement age of 66, Alex gets $750. Then when Alex's spouse applies, Social Security compares that spousal benefit at guess what age? Their full retirement age against that retirement benefit at full retirement age. And remember, you only get a spousal benefit if it's higher than your own benefit. Since that's not the case, the amount does not change when Alex's spouse applies. Blake does the same thing. And when Blake's spouse applies, Social Security does that same comparison. And since that spousal benefit at that full retirement age is greater than that own retirement benefit, that difference of $200 is added on to your current benefits. So Blake doesn't go up to $1,200. Blake simply gets that difference added on to the current benefit. And then Chris, Chris was an active volunteer. And because Chris did not pay into Social Security, Chris's only option is to wait for their spouse to apply. And when Chris's spouse applies, because Chris is full retirement age, Chris gets that maximum benefit. So the point being, first off, if you're married, figure out if you are an Alex, a Blake, or a Chris. And the morals under Chris, you will only get that maximum 50% if you are full retirement age or older when you first claim that benefit. Under Blake, if your own benefit is reduced because you claim before full retirement age, that total amount you receive after your spouse applies is also reduced. And under Alex, if your own benefit is greater than that spousal benefit, you will never ever receive a spousal benefit regardless of when you or your spouse applies. So now let's talk about what happens after that first spouse passes away. So the maximum spousal, it's 50% while your spouse is alive, but 100% or up to 100% after your spouse passes away. So after the first spouse passes away, Social Security compares your benefit versus what your spouse was receiving, and you get the higher of the two benefits. So what that means is that if you are the spouse with the higher benefit, your Social Security claiming decision impacts how much your spouse receives after you pass away. For the average worker, the difference between claiming Social Security at 70 versus 62 is about $13,000 a year. For those of you who have paid the maximum into Social Security, it's a difference of your spouse either getting $32,000 a year 
or $49,000 a year. So if you are the spouse with the higher benefits, I want to encourage you, if you have that flexibility, to take Social Security at 70 so that you can protect your spouse no matter what happens to you. So let me use some tough love for a second. The reason why I use tough love is I have four brothers, I'm the only girl, I figured out pretty early on in life that if I give tough love, men listen to me a lot better than if I'm nice to you. And you'll also notice my goal is to ensure that no matter what happens, women have as much com money coming in no matter how long they live. So here's a tough love. A lot of times husbands come up to me and they say, hey, Karen, you know your stuff, but you don't get it. And then they go on this whole long story about how hard they've worked, how much money they've paid into Social Security, how their parents died when they were 73, and how he wants to make sure that he can receive every dollar from Social Security during his lifetime so that he can go sailing and golfing and boating and whatever you men do when you retire. And the whole time, all I'm hearing is me. If you are the spouse with the higher benefits, let's change the conversation from how do we maximize my benefit to how do we maximize our benefit. And yes, I recognize that by taking Social Security, let's say at 70 versus as soon as you could, yes, we've increased the chance that you could pass away before you receive every dollar that you paid into Social Security. But if by taking Social Security at 70, we're giving your spouse the highest source of inflation-adjusted dependable income for the rest of their life. And if that gives you peace of mind that you did everything you could to protect them financially, maybe it's worth the wait. So as long as we're talking about marriages ending, let's talk about divorce. So divorce aid benefits, same calculation, 50% while they're alive, 100% after they pass away. You can receive a benefit off your ex as long as you were married for at least 10 years and your ex is age 62, dead or disabled. Now, here's the reason why it's better to be divorced than it is to be married. If you're married, remember my mom needs dad to apply so that mom can receive that social security benefit off dad. If you're divorced, that's not the case. As long as you can show that you were married for 10 years. So show up to the Social Security Administration with a copy of your marriage certificate and your divorce decree. And Social Security will compare your benefits against the benefit off your ex-spouse and give you the higher of the two. You don't have to tell your ex. Your ex won't be notified, just show up with the paperwork as long as you are 62 and your ex is age 62. Do me a favor and write this down, $1,575. In 2021, the maximum spousal benefit, regardless if you're married or divorced, is $1,575 a month. But I bring this up here because Social Security doesn't release information off your ex until both of you are age 62. So now you have a placeholder. What this also means is that if your own benefit is greater than $15.75 a month, you won't receive anything off your ex while they're alive, but keep track of them because you never know what happens when they mysteriously pass away. What about remarriage? The good news is the only way you can lose benefits off your ex is if you remarry. If your ex remarries, it's not going to affect you. Your benefits aren't going to be reduced. Their benefits won't be reduced because they have a new spouse. It's fine. Everyone's happy. Now, if you remarry, as I mentioned, you usually give up everything off your ex, but there's two things, two things to know. First, if you remarry after 60, and this also applies to widows, if you remarry after 60, you hold on to that survivor benefits. So if you remarry after 60, you could theoretically jump from survivor benefit to survivor benefit. Another thing is if your second marriage ends, 
you can become re-entitled to benefits off that first marriage. So some of you may remember Jane Fonda. And if you do, you may remember that she was married to Tom Hayden and Ted Turner, AKA Theo. Both marriages conveniently lasted 10 years. Both ended in divorce. So Jane gets the hire of her own benefits. Since Tom has passed away, the survivor benefit off Tom, or since Ted Turner is still alive, the spousal or survivor off Ted. She doesn't get all three. She gets the higher of those threes. So the morals only stay married for 10 years at a time, always marry rich people, and always keep track of your exes because they're worth more to you dead than alive. So as long as we're talking about happy topics, let's talk about taxes. So as many of you may know, once you start receiving Social Security, those benefits may get added onto your income and may become taxable if your income exceeds $25,000 if you're single or $32,000 if you're married filing jointly. But the IRS uses this interesting formula called combined income to determine how much of your Social Security benefits are taxable. So this includes your AGI, so that's your pensions, your IRAs, basically everything, plus tax-exempt income, so muni bond income is included in this calculation, even though it's excluded from federal taxation. But only half of your Social Security benefits are included in this calculation. So for some of you, if you have that flexibility to take Social Security at 70 versus as soon as you can, it may be able to reduce your taxes over the long haul because only half of your Social Security benefits are included in this calculation. So for example, there's this publication called the Journal of Financial Planning. It's even more boring than it sounds. And a couple years ago, they looked at a couple who wanted $75,000 in after-tax income in retirement. And by taking Social Security at 70 versus as soon as possible, they were able to reduce their taxes by $4,300 per year. So a question I want you all to consider before you apply for Social Security is, are you concerned about higher taxes in retirement? And if you're concerned about higher taxes, Taking Social Security at 70 may be one of your best defenses against higher taxes. For those of you who are married, another idea to consider is something called the widow tax trap, W-I-D-O-W. -W. And the widow tax trap is the risk that the surviving spouse may end up in a higher tax bracket because now they're filing as a single person. So for example, this may not apply to you, but I'm not smart enough to memorize all, so, all tax brackets. So the 12% tax bracket goes up to about 80,000 if you're married, 40,000 if you're single. So you can see how that couple who had $75,000 in income he passes away and now her income drops to 50, she may actually end up paying more in taxes because now she jumped over to the 22% tax bracket. I bring this up here because psychologically, the last thing people want to touch when they go into retirement is their IRAs, their 401ks, your own personal assets. So what, do a lot, what happens a lot of time is husband's typically older, he retires first, he turns on Social Security. At 72, he starts those RMDs. Now they're based off a higher amount. Uh, his wife does the same thing. He passes away. Now she's got to take those withdrawals from both accounts, spits off more income, maybe pushes her into a higher tax bracket. Maybe instead it's worth taking a little bit more from your IRAs and other accounts in the beginning beginning stages of retirement and letting Social Security grow for as long as possible so that we can minimize taxes over the long term. Something else to be aware of is that there are some things excluded from this calculation. For example, Roths, because those withdrawals are counted as a great big zero on your tax forms, Roth distributions do not cause your Social Security benefits to increase. So if you have that Roth and that pre-tax, 
it changes that conversation from which one do I take first to how do I strategically withdraw from both to really minimize my taxes throughout retirement. This is a great discussion to have with Ward and the rest of the team if you haven't already done so. Let's find out how we can, about all those little things we can do to really reduce the amount of taxes we pay. What this also means is um, if you have that Roth option inside your 401k, maybe shift some of your pre-tax contributions over to the Roth so that we have more flexibility to control taxes throughout retirement. If, or another option, with, or with taxes being so low, maybe now is a good time to maybe do a Roth conversion. But if you're going to do a Roth conver conversion, I really encourage you to start this discussion before you are 62. And the reason why I say that is because your Medicare premiums, granted they are recalculated every single year, but your Medicare premiums are based on your income from two years prior. So what that means is once you are 62, ideally earlier, but at least by the time you're 62, if you have a large asset that you are planning to sell to fund your retirement, talk with Ward and the other advisors on the team and discuss with them not only how selling those assets could affect your taxes next year, but how it could affect your Medicare premiums two years down the line. The reason why I bring this up is because in March of every year, the most common question I get is, hey, Karen, in 2019, I had a $150,000 capital gain distribution. Did that cause my Social Security benefits to go down? It's not that caused your Social Security benefits to go down. It's that that $150,000 capital gains dis distribution probably caused your Medicare premiums to go up. And because Medicare premiums are taken out of your Social Security benefits, sometimes, depending on um, which Medicare package you have, because it's taken out of Social Security, your net Social Security deposit went down. The reason I'm also bringing this up is these are all the things your financial advisor is thinking about behind the scenes to really help you optimize your after-tax retirement income and increase the chance that your benefits and your whole portfolio last throughout your lifetime. Another quick idea that goes along with this, the Journal of Financial Planning again, had a very boring article last year, but they looked at a couple who had $60,000 coming from their IRAs and about $60,000 coming from Social Security. And by using a strategic retirement withdrawal plan, which they defined as taking Social Security at 70 and also having that Roth and strategically bringing it in, they were able to reduce their taxes over their lifetime by over $400,000, their Medicare premiums went down by $43,000 over their lifetime, and the longevity of their portfolio was extended by three to five years. Point being, there's a lot of little things we can do to help improve your retirement income and reduce your taxes, but it begins by having that discussion before you get into retirement and doing all these little small strategic changes that can really pay off and make a difference, especially if you expect to have a longer retirement. So we've gone through a lot. I'm sure your biggest question though is, how do I decide when to take Social Security? A lot of information, but I really think it comes down to four simple questions. Number one, are you working? If you're working and under your full retirement age, let's just keep it simple. Do not take Social Security. Next, talk with Ward and Chris and Andy and Bill about how much you can withdraw from your portfolio. If you can live off that, maybe take Social Security at 70. If it's not enough, maybe take sooner rather than later. As for your life expectancy and that break even age, only a factor if you're single. If you're single and you think you're going to live forever, take at 70. If you're not quite sure, take whenever you want.
But if you're married, I don't like looking at break-even calculations. I don't look like looking at your individual life expectancy. I don't care about how long your parents lived. And the reason why I say that is because there's a 50% chance one of you is going to live until age 90. So for that reason, that really cool Excel spreadsheet, I don't want to say it goes out the window but maybe extend the ages a little bit longer. So if you're married and both of you worked and both of you paid into Social Security, here's how it goes. The spouse with the lower benefit has more flexibility as to when to take Social Security. If you're 62 and you're retired and you have the lower benefit and you want to take Social Security, I'm not going to stop you. If you're 66 and you're done working and you have a lower benefit or you're still working and you want to turn it on, I'm not going to stop you. Because you have the lower benefits, you'll switch over to that survivor benefit. So your benefit, your Social Security, is a benefit that takes any pressure off the portfolio. What I'm seeing a lot of people do right now is if you have the lower benefit, because the markets are doing so well, they're holding off on it. So that when the market or if the market ever has a little dip or recovery, they'll turn it back on, they'll turn Social Security on then to take the pressure off the portfolio. But if you are the spouse with a higher benefit, I want to encourage you to optimize your benefit as much as possible so that we can not only maximize yours, but we'll maximize the survivor benefit which maximizes the benefit over both lifetimes. So here's the re reality. There's a lot of information about Social Security. And my goal is to help everyone and give as much information as possible that helps as many people as possible. But everyone's situation is different. And what worked for your colleague, your brother, your cousin, your best friend, may not be the right decision for you because you have your own goals, your own income needs, your own assets. And that's why we really encourage everyone, before you claim Social Security, sit down with Ward, Chris, Andy, or Bill. Explore your options. Explore how that decision impacts your withdrawal rates, how that affects your asset allocation, how it affects your taxes, and everything else we have discussed today. So with that, Ward, I will turn it back to you. Karen, thanks so much for doing a great job with that presentation. Um, enjoyed uh, several of your uh, illustrations and appreciate your enthusiasm. Key takeaway is only stay married for 10 years and marry wealthy people every 10 years. That's what I heard from your presentation. So I want you to know I was paying attention. Um, on a serious note, other things that I think are really key that I took away is delaying claiming your Social Security benefit after your FRA for retirement age. For every year you wait, it's a permanent 8% increase in your Social Security benefit. There aren't too many investments or other vehicles out there that give you a guaranteed permanent 8% inflation adjusted. So really the objective of delaying until age 70, if at all possible, uh, is really a strong plan, especially for the larger of the two benefits. Um, related to that was the surviving spouse. So when the first of a uh, husband-wife situation, when the first passes away, the surviving spouse gets the larger of the two benefits. So again, in your illustration with your mom and dad, your dad has the higher benefit, your mom has the lower benefit. If your mom passes away first, your dad keeps his benefit. But if your dad passes away first, your mom will forego her benefit and take over your dad's benefit. So that's what we mean that the surviving spouse gets the higher of the two benefits and that again speaks to the importance of maximizing that larger benefit which means waiting as long as possible until age 70 to uh, take that benefit. Because of the fact Covenant Wealth Strategies, we do comprehensive financial planning. I loved the examples and the illustrations, which so often are frankly not even part of a presentation on social security claiming strategies 
about mixing and matching the income sources in terms of the IRA, the Roth IRA. So you've got money coming in from your IRA, or if you still have a 401k that you haven't rolled over, and that money is obviously subject to income tax. And the higher your taxable income, when you get to age 65 and you're paying Medicare premiums, you actually pay a penalty, right? Or a surcharge or whatever you want to refer to it as. Uh, but literally hundreds of dollars a month more because your income is too high, right? Um, and then also not only the Medicare, but also Medicare Part D, which is the prescription plan, and you pay a penalty on that because your income is too high. And so the idea of mixing and matching sources, because the money that comes from a Roth IRA does not count towards those numbers, and if I understand correctly, Karen, does not count towards the taxation of your Social Security either. So even though municipal bond income, in fact, although it's tax-free, does count towards you know, Social Security taxation, the withdrawals, at least under current laws, until they figure it out, uh, the withdrawals coming out of an IRA, a Roth IRA are tax-free, and they don't count for Social Security taxation, and they don't count for... Medicare premium uh, surcharges or uh, prescription surcharges as well. So to your point, the value of working with a financial advisor, and, and one of the last things I wrote down here was um, you know, given an illustration, a Journal of Financial Planning magazine, which is boring. It's about as boring as watching paint dry. I read it myself. Uh, but an illustration of, of basically working with an advisor, optimizing these things, $400,000 in income tax savings, plus over $40,000 in Medicare premium surcharge or penalty uh, taxes, basically. So ballpark $440,000, $450,000 in savings, and it just kind of begs the question, what's the value of working with a good advisor who knows their stuff on this? And so I appreciate very much selfishly i appreciate you bringing this to light and i'm sure that chris and randy and bill uh would uh would agree with me so thank you so much for your presentation uh we do have questions so there's an opportunity and i want to suggest to you that this is a great opportunity uh to ask karen some questions it's not often that we get folks who are so well versed and karen is obviously an expert on social security and different retirement strategies as I mentioned at the outset, Karen is a CFP, so uh, you know not just uh, uh, working with MFS, but a 20-year veteran of the industry and a certified financial planner with an emphasis on retirement and Social Security claiming strategies. So in terms of questions that have come in already, um, so one question is an interesting one, not directly related to your presentation, but with Social Security offices being closed, so right now because of the pandemic, uh, you can't go in person to a Social Security office. Uh, what are best practices for how to actually uh, get a hold of somebody at Social Security these days? Oh, sure. So this has come up a lot, and I was kind of expecting this. Uh, a couple things. First off, do not call the Social Security 800 number. And I say that for a few reasons. Number one, the people who staff the 800 number, uh, they've only been trained on Social Security for six weeks. And their goal is to get off the phone with you within four minutes. So they have not been trained thoroughly on Social Security, nor do they really want to answer your question. Additionally, the average wait time is 23 minutes, and that was before the pandemic, so who knows how long it could be right now. So I really encourage two ideas. First, I encourage you to uh, apply, um, contact your local Social Security office. So just Google Social Security Office Locator. Again, Social Security Office Locator. You'll put in your zip code. I believe the zip code for Wilmington is, I have no idea, 19801, we'll say. Perfect. And if you type that in, out pops your, the number for your local Social Security office. If you're going to call them, I've heard that it's better to call them Wednesdays through Fridays and do not call the first week of the month. Ideally, you want to call them Thursday or Friday after 4 p.m. because most people have better things to do and you'll get through a lot quicker. 
Another quick idea, if you plan on applying for Social Security or Medicare within the next probably six months, I will say, the Social Security offices will probably be closed. So you'll have to apply online. If you haven't done so, uh, go ahead and create my own Social Security account. And if you're like me, here's the thing, you probably will only pay attention to this uh, little blue box that says create your account today. To me, the more interesting thing though is, do you have a security freeze or fraud alert on your credit report? So Social Security uses your credit report to verify who you are. And if you have a freeze on your credit report, they can't verify who you are and they can't access your information. So if you were affected like me by the Equifax hack, I have a credit freeze in my report, I cannot access my Social Security benefit unless I call them and ask them to unfreeze my credit report and then I can access my Social Security benefits and, and apply online for Social Security or Medicare. So I hope those are a couple tips to help you out or even a friend or a colleague while the Social Security offices are closed. Great, Karen, and I would suggest to you that the uh, Newcastle County, so that Basin Road, which is over uh, 141 towards Newcastle, uh, is the address there, the 920 West Basin Road, that's just on the east side of the I-95 141 interchange, which of course is a disaster for construction purposes, but you don't have to use that office. There's also a great office in Elkton, Maryland, and so it doesn't matter what state you're in, we've uh, worked with clients, again, pre-pandemic, we would oftentimes uh, take clients or meet clients at the Elkton, Maryland office. And we've had great success uh, working with the people in the Elkton, Maryland office. So I just share that information with you. Um, question for you, Karen, when you talk about the um, security freeze or the fraud freeze. So there are three different bureaus, Equifax and Experian and uh, TransUnion. Do you know which, is it, is it any one of those or there's three different ones? So how, how would that work? It's funny you say that. So as I understand it, it's all three, but okay. since you asked, I'm gonna share this with you. I don't know if I can, ex let me see if I can maximize this. So you're the first one to ever at. Um, ask this. So speaking of the Equifax hack, look at this. Equifax is the identity services provider that Social Security uses. I have no so, comments. So not the fact that, I mean, so if I had a, a, a freeze on Experian or TransUnion, that doesn't necessarily prevent Social Security from validating me. I only need to be concerned with Equifax. I don't know. But if you do well, have it frozen with Equifax, definitely you can't access it. Okay, it looks like what you just put up there is that they said that Equifax is who Social Security uses to verify your identity. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to indicate uh, that that's the case. The other thing that if you could speak to for just a moment, Karen, is this idea of create your account today. And the reason I bring that up to you is I have done some reading, I have heard of situations where fraudsters basically go in and set up a social security account on behalf of Karen, right? So if I'm a fraudster and I go in, I set up a social security account on behalf of Karen, and then when Karen goes to create her account today, she's locked out of her own account because a fraudster has already, can you speak to that a little bit and just maybe the idea that, is it a good idea for everybody, regardless of their age or their plans to file, that they should in fact go to ssa.gov and set up their social security account to prevent a fraudster from blocking them. I've definitely heard of it happening and which is why social security recommends to everyone set it up as soon as you can so that no one else sets it up for you. It's a real concern. It's amazing. If we could take all this energy and put it into good things like finding a cure for cancer, we'd probably, uh, you know, we'd probably be all, already be there. Uh, there are some folks who haven't paid into Social Security uh, through, you know, um, maybe there's a stay-at-home spouse, but then there's other people who um, maybe they work for uh, state or local government. Um, 
you know, sometimes people on the police force are not paying into mm-hmm. Social Security or certain other employment situations. How does Social Security work for those people, Karen? So they've, if you've never, so let's say you're a full-time fire fighter, you've never paid it, and that's been your only job. So you're probably wondering if you can receive a survivor benefit off your spouse after they pass away. So I could explain it to you, but just Google Social Security GPO calculator. GPO technically stands for Government Pension Offsets. I remember it as grouchy partner offset because it makes you grouchy that you may not receive a benefit off your spouse. So what you do, again, I don't feel like going through, I find it's easier for me just to show you this calculator versus explaining it to you. So you'll put in your pension amount, let's say it's 2000, you'll put in your spouse's social security benefits, and then out pops the amount you would receive as a survivor benefits. So even if, say for example, if I was a firefighter, Mm -hmm. even if I didn't receive social security, my spouse could still receive a survivor benefit uh, from social security. Is that what I So if you are a firefighter, nope, so you are a firefighter, and you're wondering, hey, if my spouse passes away first, can I receive their social security benefits? Oh, okay. So this is your pension. This is your spouse's social security benefits. And this out pops how much you can receive as a survivor benefit from social security. So I'd still be receiving my pension of $2,000 and then I'd be receiving the 2166 as a survivor. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay, I, I had misunderstood the scenario that you illustrated. Okay, so it's not a function of I'm a firefighter and I pass away and how much does my spouse get? It's a function of I'm a firefighter, I'm collecting a pension, my spouse is collecting Social Security, they pass away, how much of their Social Security do I get as, a, as their survivor? Okay, great. Um, You had mentioned the idea of a break-even analysis, and I just wanted to point out, and perhaps you can speak for a moment to this idea that, in fact, Social Security used to have a break-even analysis calculator on their website that has not been there for the past several years. So to your point, Social Security removed the break-even calculator from their website you want to just speak to that and again uh, give you an opportunity to make that point sure so social security so, uh, let me back up some of you may be familiar with the concept of behavioral finance and which is sometimes our emotions gets in the way of us making really good uh, financial decisions so as part of that they realize that that break even analysis. So break even is if I took social security at 70 instead of 66, how long would I have to live in order to make up for that difference? So what they found is that by having that break even analysis, people were more focused on what did I lose because I didn't live to that age. So people were actually taking social security sooner than if they hadn't seen that because they're so focused on dying too, uh, dying too soon. And as I'm sure you agree with me, Ward, our concern as financial professionals isn't that you die too soon and you didn't live until that break-even age. It's that you actually lived longer than you expected, and we want to make sure you have as, me- as much dependable income as you want. The beauty of that break-even age, it's simple. There's so few inputs, boom, and you feel good about it. What I wish the break-even age would also incorporate is some of those more interesting dynamics that we've talked about, War, that really makes a difference. Because I think it's uh, how much are, how, could your taxes be going up because you're taking it as soon as you can? Are you including your withdrawal, uh, how you optimize your withdrawals? All those little things to me are much more important than that break-even age. And then finally, if you're married, there's a 50% chance one of you is going to live until 90, so it doesn't really matter. And also, if you are the surviving wife, on average, you're going to live at least five years younger, longer after your husband passes away. Yeah. So that's so my opinion. The, uh, 
Yeah, that's the break-even analysis. So, in fact, my understanding is that Social Security took it down simply because it wasn't being uh, factored in. The idea of who had the larger benefit and the fact that that's not payable just for your life uh, or your break-even analysis, but for the uh, for the joint life. And uh, Karen, you and I are very much on the same page just in terms of um, the fastest growing. Now, these statistics are prior to COVID, right? But the fastest growing segment of the population in the United States was actually those age 100 and over, right? And when we talk about the fact that if I've got a husband and wife both age 65, on average, one of them will live to 90. Well, that's on average in terms of people that have pre-existing health conditions at age 65. That's on average with maybe people that live in... Um, uh, areas that are not as conducive to longevity or health. Maybe they uh, live in the inner city or don't have access to, you know, uh, vegetables and fruits. Maybe, you know, all these different things, right? So most of our clients are going to be people who are in better circumstances. They're better educated. They have better access to health care. They've taken better care of themselves. And they have every advantage. And so to say that on average, husband, wife, age 65, one's going to live to 90 is, I think, in, in itself is somewhat, not to say misleading, but I mean, just in, it doesn't take into account factors that are germane to the population that we serve. And I'll point out one other thing, and that is uh, we have a, a lot of our clients are involved in the biotech industry and healthcare oh. industry. And we also, uh, from an investment standpoint, we have some investments that we've made in the biotech and healthcare industry. And let me tell you, I mean, the stuff that they're working on is crazy when you talk about longevity. And today is, you know, 2021. So somebody who's 100 years old today was born in 1921. And in 1921, at their birth, their life expectancy was not 70 years old. And so they've already lived 50% longer than what they expected when they were born. And so to your point, Karen, the issue is not trying to get every last dime out of Social Security if I die too soon. The issue absolutely is if I live longer than I expect, which in fact is the case of the majority of Americans, okay? And also, by the way, you know, and, and unfortunately, we've had, to, we've had to have these conversations with the surviving spouse so commonly, if there was a pension, the pensioner, let's just again say the husband, the husband passes away. Now the widow, the surviving wife gets 50% of the pension. Oh, and by the way, they lose the smaller of the two social security benefits. Oh, and by the way, now they have to pay for certain things that maybe the husband was doing around the house or that sort of thing. And so I'm less concerned, right? If you can't afford to retire when you've got two people here and everything's going well, right, then the fact of the matter is you can't afford to retire and you need to work longer. But like you, I have been there when that first spouse dies and having some of those very, very hard conversations and it's heartbreaking, you know, to sit with a typically a widow and, and talk about what they can and cannot do going forward and how they thought everything was good and then he passed away and all of a sudden, not only are they dealing with the grief of the loss of a loved one, but now they're finding out economically things aren't perhaps, uh, they're not as well prepared as they, as they had understood they were to be. So I'm with you 100% trying to maximize the experience of the survivor and not leave them stranded. And we've seen people who, I would just say, tried to maximize things upon their you know, retirement in their 60s. And in fact, the surviving spouse was left in a very, very bad situation. So I, I share your concern on those things. I can't imagine that. Just the emotional transition along with the financial transition, that's a lot for a widow to take in. Yep, yep. And we've worked with, I mean, we've worked with a number of widows and, you know, they talk about for the first year, I mean, the first time around the calendar, right? The first Mother's Day, the first birthday, the first Christmas, the first, all these different firsts. It's just a mental fog. Like they can't even, they, they don't, after it's over, I think it's like a PS, you know, PTSD kind of thing in terms of just the, the trauma. 
Um, and so just layering in uh, financial you know, hardship is it's a very, very difficult situation. And it's interesting too, I would tell you that you know, working with financial advisors and, and working with people like uh, Jennifer uh, and other uh, per se representatives from different companies, you know, they tell me flat out that a lot of times they see the products that uh, that their clients are buying and there's absolutely no provision whatsoever made for the spouse. So that's one of the things when we work with a client, financial planning client, the husband and wife are our client and we have very frank conversations with both of them present not only about optimizing their social security and tax planning strategies, but even about pension claiming strategies and what the conversation is going to be like with their surviving spouse, depending upon the decisions that they make with their pension claiming strategies. So good stuff. Uh, Michelle, anything that's come through on your side? I think that is all the questions we've received. Okay. Let me see here if we have anything else that we want to cover. Oh, uh, the topic of HSAs. Can you speak oh. a little bit to the topic of HSAs and uh, Social Security and Medicare? Sure. So for HSAs, uh, if you have an HSA, ask yourself how important it really is to make those contributions to the HSAs. And the reason that's a good question to discuss with Ward and everyone else is because if you're receiving Social Security and you're 65 and older, you cannot refuse Medicare Part A. Medicare Part A is free. It covers your hospitals. And because you're receiving Medicare Part A, you are no longer in a high deductible plan. And because of that, you can no longer make contributions to your HSA. So if you want to continue to make contributions to your health savings account, don't take Social Security if you're 65 and older, because if you're receiving Social Security, you can no longer make contributions to your health savings accounts. Um, and is it true that you can use the HSA money to help cover expenses in retirement, including, for example, the premiums on a Medicare supplement policy, and you can pull those monies out tax-free from your HSA to cover those costs? I would double check with a Medicare specialist. As I understand, HSAs can be used for Medicare um, Medicare Advantage, but not Medigap, but I could be wrong on that. Okay, okay. Uh, we've got two other questions that have come in. One question is, uh, if you're self-employed, which interesting, a lot of times our clients might retire or might, per se, get retired a little sooner than they were expecting on it, right? Uh, expecting to be retired. And so uh, they would be self, they might set up a consulting firm and do a little bit of uh, self-employment and so a question that came in about the idea of possibly putting your spouse on salary if it, when, and, and whether you're self-employed, uh, you know, after you retire or whether you're just self-employed, mm -hmm. the idea of putting your spouse on salary, uh, which obviously it has to be for legitimate work. You can't just put them on salary if they never show up. But uh, the idea of doing that uh, in terms of trying to get them a higher Social Security benefit based on their wages. So if you could speak to that for a moment. So it's very unique to everyone's situation. So a helpful little tool I would use is this Social Security Retirement Estimator. So you'll click on this link and then you'll click on Estimate Your Social Security Benefit. You'll put in some basic information about yourself, out pops your current benefit. Uh, so what you can do is put in some what you think you want to pay your spouse and then s compare that number against two things. Number one, compare it to that spousal benefit off you. And if it's lower than that spousal benefit off you, maybe it's not worth paying your spouse additional money because now you have to pay all those FICA taxes, those payroll taxes, so maybe it's not worth it. Another way of looking at it is also consult with your CPA to understand how those additional, that additional Social Security benefit you may receive, how much more you have to pay in taxes. Another way I've seen this tool used is if you're thinking of retiring sooner than that full retirement age, go to this, put in your um, stuff, out pops your current benefit, and then if put in zero for the years when you're thinking of retiring or transitioning to consulting work, out pops your new Social Security estimated benefit as well. 
Great. So again, the uh, ssa.gov is a great tool. You should go set up your own identity, uh, and then you can use it to get your most recent statement, as well as to doing some uh, planning and projection. We've got one other question that came in, um, and that is on the topic of remarrying. So somebody's in their 60s, and um, they're divorced, and they're thinking about whether or not they should get remarried. Um, is there a relatively simple or easy way, Karen? I know you touched on this a little bit during your presentation, but how should we determine financially whether it's a good idea for them to get remarried or, or uh, stay, stay single? So if you're getting remarried, um, let me see. We can send you, I'll have Jen send you this. So we have this nice little divorce and remarriage decision tree that may help you out. The, if you're getting remarried at an older age, uh, the best, the one thing you may want to consider is getting remarried after 60. So that if you get remarried after 60, you get to hold on to that survivor benefit off your current spouse, off your former spouse. Now, if you remarry after 60, um, that spousal benefit may change, but keep in mind that maximum spousal benefit is 1575 a month. So right. I would say for most people, it may not be a big difference, uh, but that's the only thing that could change if you remarry after 60, whether or not you get 1575 or something smaller. And in this particular instance, if the person asking the question was the primary breadwinner previously, their own benefit is going to be significantly greater than 1575. So it would not be to their disadvantage economically to remarry. It may be to the person that they would be marrying. So they, that, that person would need to ask the question, but in terms of the primary breadwinner whose social security benefits over 1575, economically not a problem. I'll add one caveat that I heard years ago in a social security presentation that I thought was kind of funny is, you know, if it's very important to you to be, re, to be married, uh, go to Canada. So you can basically get legally married in Canada, which apparently doesn't, uh, you know, impact your social security here in the United States. So for purposes of being married, you're married, but for purposes of social security, uh, you're not. Is that still the case? Or, I mean, just in terms of, you know, covenant wealth strategies, there's an angle to everything, right? So it fits right in there with your get married every 10 years and only to wealthy people. So can you go to Canada and get married and not impact your social security benefit? Um, I don't know about that because I know if you get married, in other countries, it's legally not binding, I thought, in the U.S. Right, which I would will... be the point, which would be the point, that is to say, if it's important to, per se, quote unquote, get married, you can go to another country, say Canada, and get married so that you're married, but then you come back to the U.S. and it doesn't impact your Social Security because it's not, to your point, legally binding in the U.S. It doesn't affect your Social Security or your taxes or anything else. Yeah. <laughs> so a little bit of an angle there. Well, Karen, we really appreciate your time uh, and, and quite frankly, your knowledge and expertise. And I think that you're just excellent uh, at what you do and you're, you're uh, superb in your presentation as well. So uh, we're just delighted to, to have you with us and to uh, bring um, your knowledge and expertise and presentation skills to uh, our clients, to our guests. So thank you so very, very much for your time. Jennifer, thank you, and Tony for uh, bringing Karen to us this afternoon. Uh, it's been a delight. And if uh, there are questions that may have come in that we haven't answered, we'll uh, try and get you answers to those. Karen, I'd love to see that uh, divorce dis or the remarriage decision tree. So if you make sure that gets to us, uh, that would be wonderful. So without uh, further ado, folks, have a delightful rest of your evening. And thanks again so much for joining us. Take care.